You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Well, welcome back to Bookstorm Podcast, loyal listeners all over the globe. Last count, 62 countries, Kristen, 60, um, over a thousand cities, 45 states and growing. Where else can we go? We're literally all over the world. And I love using that word, word literally when it actually applies. <laughs> we're here today because we're super excited. You're going to love who we got with us. Um, you know him. You love his books. We have Matthew Quirk. Matthew, welcome to Bookstorm. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me give our listeners a little bit of your bio because some people follow you. They love your books. Maybe they don't know your history and it's very impressive and interesting. So Matthew studied history and literature at Harvard College. After graduating, he spent five years at the Atlantic reporting on crime, private military contractors, terrorism prosecutions and international gangs. Wow. And I see this all coming out in your book, no wonder, and what a way to use world life experiences. Um, many of you know him and love him because of the Night Agent television series. It premiered on Netflix this March, 2023. It was an instant number one hit around the world. Kristen and I loved it. My husband and I binged it. I think we watched the whole thing in two or three nights. Um, so if you haven't seen that yet, listeners, you got to turn into that too. Not only that, but Matthew is an Edgar Award finalist, a winner of the ITW Thriller Award for the best first novel. Uh, this book we're here to talk to him about today, new release, Inside Threat, had a starred review from Publishers Weekly. Publishers Weekly says, Quirk masterfully ramps up the tension and paranoia as the body count rises. Readers will be eager for a sequel. And yes, Kristen and I can attest. Yeah, we are. We want the sequel. So Matthew, welcome. So happy to have you here. Yeah, it's, it's fun to be here. Can't wait to dive in. Well, we are here, of course, to talk about Inside Threat. And I won't give away any spoilers, but I do give our listeners a little bit of a summary of the book. And I would love for you to jump in or add anything at the end if you think I've left it out. But it is tricky here because there's a lot we can't say. Mm -hmm. So now in your story, we are thrown into a worst case scenario at the White House. This is code black. This is what every CIA agent trains for. This is what they prepare for. We have a situation where the White House has been breached. Now, the president is forced to flee to an impenetrable fortress, basically under a mountain, something that actually exists, and they have to defend against whatever is coming next. Only the most trusted agents are brought along. Now, one of those is Eric Hill. He has given his life to the Secret Service. This is his purpose, his family. He has earned a stellar reputation. He's regarded by many as a hero. But he has some growing disillusionment with those in power and some of the forces at play in the White House. But he can't ignore his instincts. He jumps in. He does his job with excellence, as he always does. Now, Eric begins to uncover a conspiracy at the highest levels of power. Was this attack orchestrated by someone within the service or even higher? He has to rely on every bit of his training to save the president to even protect those that he is working with. But this is where that tension just starts ramping, ramping up. We loved it. Did you want to add anything, Matthew, at all? No, that was great. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, we'll dive in. And Chris, why don't you go ahead and kick us off? Okay, so for our listeners, uh, I just got to say, 
You're going to thoroughly enjoy every single page of this thrill ride inside the world of the Secret Service. Their one and only goal, protect POTUS. My two favorite characters, Eric and Cody, talked about not allowing cynicism and anger to blind you. They said, we need to find the courage to keep believing that, and I'm going to quote, people will do the right thing. Institutions will hold. The truth always comes out in the end. And I had to ask you, Matthew, as the writer um, who unveiled to the everyday reader this constant battle going on behind the scenes to protect the nation, do you believe these, these uh, goals are true? That good will always uh, come out in the end, that people will do the right thing? And what did Eric and Cody have to abandon or surrender or maybe even embrace in order to keep this belief, to keep moving forward and believe that good will prevail? Well, that's, I mean, that's the central theme of the book. And, um, you know, what's nice about the books is you don't have to say yes or no. You can embroider and look at it from their two perspectives. And um, I kind of built the book around it in a certain way, or at least the two main characters, because they represent like different poles of that. Um, and Eric is a little disillusioned when we start out, maybe a lot. And um, Amber Cody, who's younger, it's her first week on the um, Secret Service detail at the White House, which she's aspired to her whole life because her father gave his life serving that. So it's nice to have people who kind of come to a question like that from different sides. And then the book is really an examination of that as they argue and then demonstrate it through action and all that stuff. So that's, I mean, that's fun because you can take a book where, you know, there's gunfights and explosions in this cool, like real life secret bunker and also give it a certain like aboutness um, and hopefully some thematic and stuff I think about all the time. So um, will the good always come out in the end? No, <laughs> no, not at all. Not a given at all. And um, I mean, like the, the short answer is if you work for it. And even then you need to work for it all the time because these insidious forces are always at play. Um, and the balance with a book like this and with writing DC novels is the genre has certain demands, which is like conspiracies. And there's, there's something, and I love this stuff. And, you know, before I worked close to power in DC, I was, you know, probably inclined to think, you know, there's a few people pulling all the strings and there's, I mean, there's certain truth to that, but it's, that's too simple. Um, and people want, that kind of like one puppet master thing, you know, Frank from, I think it was Frank in House of Cards. And House of Cards, wonderful show. I mean, not wonderful, like a dark, but like truly entertaining, amazing show. That went all the way down the cynicism road. Um, and, you know, then you have certain things like West Wing that goes like all the way up the kind of like hope, old Frank Capra kind of road. Um, so I try to walk through the middle because a lot of people, they like conspiracy thrillers and they want to think that it's all evil and you, you know, you pull back the curtain and there's some like cult thing happening, um, cause that, that makes for an, an exciting story, but I fortunately or unfortunately, cause I was so close to it. I feel a responsibility to get some reality in there and to work against that kind of thing because that can breed cynicism and sort of taking off my author hat, putting on like my citizen hat for a second. I don't want to encourage cynicism. So in the books, I try to like tell a good story and satisfy the demands of the genre. And then it's nice to, you get to level with people in that with that in a certain way, but then also bring them back to like, Yes, there's really hardworking people in DC. And if people are willing to do the work and fight back against the BS, then um, you can make a change. Instead of saying, just like DC is corrupt, I'm just going to watch, um, you know, on TV and completely give up on all politics and check out. And that's, that's actually how. Um, powerful people get away with kind of corrupting the government when there isn't 
investment from the citizens. And you see that in places where democracy is like completely eroded. And I think, you know, this is what we love as a reader, because we want a little fantasy. We want you to take us somewhere a little extreme. Maybe it's not reality, but in within there, you did weave some reality in. And you showed us the moral character of a couple people that continuously pushed and pursued for righteousness. And a little bit, it says to each of us, Kristen and I were talking before the show, that we can do stuff like this. We, in, in our own small little world, you know, like you said, just by paying attention and listening and, and, vo and voting or whatever it is that we might do. Um, and you talked a lot about cynicism, which is cool because that's Kristen's next question, falls in perfect. Yeah, actually, I'm going to pick up right where you both left off. Um, we, we hear a lot of people say things like, well, everybody's crooked. There's no truth. Um, you know, you can't fight City Hall, so don't even try. In fact, President Klein in your story says that's their weapon, you know, cynicism. You believe that everyone's crooked, that there's no truth and they win. Why is this so dangerous in a democracy? Because this on a citizen level really expresses itself in voting, but even in other ways. And I was wondering if you could kind of press into that a little bit about some of your thoughts here. Sure, it's, it's really fascinating. And um, to take like, Russia with Vladimir Putin, you know, Vladimir Putin will say things that are obvious lies. And um, there's a great book on this uh, by Timothy Snyder. Uh, I forget the name of it, um, but it's his book on sort of Putin and democracy. And he did, like uh, a demagogue doesn't want you to believe the lies. They also don't mind being discovered being corrupt. They, um, want you to think that everyone's corrupt and everyone is full of, you know, BS. Um, because then people just check out and then you can do whatever you want to the government. You can fire the provincial parliaments, you can do whatever um, because people think they're all corrupt. And there's a weird thing where like, have these dictators and they'll be sort of like blatant about their corruption and in a certain way, that feels candid. It's like, hey, we're all doing this, but I'll level with you, you know? And then people just think, well, at least this guy's a straight shooter and um, they're all full of crap. And what's the point of doing anything? And what does it matter if, you know, this guy who seems like my kind of guy um, is taking all the power or it's going to be someone else. So, I mean, it's really toxic and yeah. there's a lot of backsliding of democracy around the world. And, and it's, it's the United States. It's not a given that like, we'll have this wonderful democracy. You need to work for it and um, prevent these sort of insidious things from happening. So, um, you know, that's, I'm glad you picked up on that. And that's a theme and it's, it's nice in these books. Um, yeah, I should say the book is like a thrill ride. I really enjoy getting into the themes. Um, so like this story and the, you know, the kind of like entertainment comes first, but it's nice to work this real stuff in there. And I'm so glad you enjoyed that. Um, and then it's nice to work in some of the real life kind of gee whiz stuff of like Raven Rock, this bunker mm -hmm. complex under the mountain is a real place. Um, because it's, it's nice to read a book for me at least. And feel like you haven't just eaten like a whole bag of potato chips um because it's like yeah gunfights and people running around and explosions but you're also like oh there's like there's a certain um you know there's some richness to this and this is about what's going on in the world so um you know that's that's what i i try to do well i loved it because your book was the counterpoint to the paralysis we were just talking about and that is taking action and there were points in your story where i was like i think i would just lay down under a rock and hide and not do anything further because it's hopeless. But that that's what you were showing is that participation, the action, taking every measure. That's the answer to the paralysis that can creep in. So I thought that was yeah. great. Yeah. And I mean, often when I write these things, there'll be a character who's um, a stand in. Like for me, I'm working on a book right now. And the, the person, the main person isn't like a Secret Service agent or CIA case officer or something. Um, and I gave it to my agent and he's like, well, you need to, this person needs to stand up a little bit. I'm like, well, that's what I would do. I would, I would run from the guy with the gun in a subway. And he's like, yeah, but it's a thriller. So, you know, um, you need to balance 
the relatability of these people to the satisfaction we all get in thrillers with people being larger than life. And, and you know, in some ways it was nice to have Amber Cody because she's new to the White House. So you can sort of see all of these, um, these institutions through her eyes. And, and I had this in DC, I was in there for all my formative years um, where I would just wander around and look at everything and be in awe of it. And DC um, is a cesspool takes because like, I get like really, like I hear John Philip Sousa marches when I, you know, walk down from the Capitol to the White House and all these institutions, you know, and then, but then there's a certain aspect where those institutions, people use your respect for those institutions to, um, to, to like get away with stuff. And those institutions are built so we can ignore the fact that they're just run by humans and they're very vulnerable. Yeah, very well put. I was just in DC and I, I share that thought of just standing there like, this is incredible what we have built. You know, it yeah, and it's it's so hard to get this across. Like, I mean, even if it's like a congressman, you know, and congressman, there's like 435 or something. And, you know, when I read the newspaper every day, I'm like, congressman, they're like used car salesmen, you know, they're, uh, you know, and, um, but like when you go into Congress and you go to a congressman's office, you're like, you know, it's That's like right. going to church when you're a kid. <laughs> and I mean, going into the White House, you are like, on your game um so you know it's nice to to get that stuff across and i think that's the appeal of you know some of these books that kind of take you behind the curtain mm -hmm. and that call really falls into my next question because we all have heard about the secret service and their commitment to protect the president and this nation at any cost including the loss of their own life or choosing over the life of their the life of their loved ones, they would protect the president. This came out in your story a little bit in such a strong way in two very different characters. So we had Eric Hill, the more experienced, and then we had Amber Cody, brand new. They both had this innate um, ability to forfeit their very life. And it sort of blew my mind while, while reading it, including at one time President Klein came up with this same dilemma of saving his wife. So I just wonder for you as the writer, like what does it take, what's the character trait that enables these secret service to walk in and say, I'm gonna give my life up, my very life up for one person, the president. We see this in our military. And let me add this, thank you to all of our military, anyone who's listening, you do this every single day. It sort of just blows my mind. And as you as the writer, what did you instill in them? Was it, what's their extreme commitment? Is it courage? Do you think it's DNA? Do you think it's trained and fostered? Or maybe it's a little of everything. Yeah, I mean, well, the first time I really ran into this was, um, my first two books were very close to like a thriller version of myself. You know, somebody goes to DC, gets in over their head in the fancy world, and then, um, so on and it's like a comes from a family of con men it's like a crafty kind of thing and then I moved to San Diego and I got really close with some friends uh who husband was going through um some some military training for some special operations stuff and I was like oh wow people in the world and you know you only meet them in certain communities just the, the the physical sacrifice of it, because he was going through one of the training programs that's like one of the hardest ones in, in the world. And, and he looked like he was going to die. <laughs> he was, it was so hard. And then, you know, he would just get up at like four in the morning and like swim to an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean or in the dark and like put a bomb on a boat and blow up the boat. And I was like, you're, you're doing this and then you're coming out to have dinner and then you're letting me like yap about, you know, bullshit, excuse me. And like, and just go to bed because this sounds so hard, you know? And that's just the physical demands of it. And, and then on the other part, there's like the, um, you know, putting your life at risk. And, you know, firefighters do this, uh, you know, doctors do this, especially recently. Um, and so it was, it was really moving for me because I am not one of these people. 
Um, and it was so valuable to, you know, see a three-dimensional person like that because it's so easy to make like a G.I. Joe character, you know, where it's just like going through walls and bodies and like, you know, you get shot and you're like, oh, you know, and you pour some whiskey in it and go on. So it was nice. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't really have gone that way. Like I wrote a couple basically straight up military thrillers or kind of born identity books after that, Cold Barrel Zero and Dead Man Switch. And um, they just came out of my fascination with, with that sacrifice in that world. And, and what's funny about it is, um, I mean, there's something very special about those people and that sacrifice. Um, and on the other hand, especially like the Secret Service and FBI, they're law enforcement. And so culturally, they're kind of in like the cop sphere of things. And, and police do this too. And so coming from the outside, I'm like in awe of it and think it's, you know, so crazy that you would lay down your life for somebody else. But the, the actual treatment of it day to day is like cop black humor. So it's like, yeah, I got to see, you know, so it's, it's interesting to get closer to it and talk to them because, you know, there is this myth that like, when you take the oath, you say, and I will lay my life down for the president that you don't. Um, and if you lay your life down for the president, something's gone horribly wrong. So it's, it's a bit of like, a, that's movie stuff. When you see somebody like jumping, I mean, they will do that, but that would be a worst case scenario. Um, and that happened with Reagan um, and they saved his life. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just a fascinating world. And it's nice to actually talk to people who, who do it because then you it, you get that nice texture where they talk about it with this like black humor instead of the like my from the outside I'm going to be so reverent about it um, so and then you want to be very careful when you treat it so you have that reverence but you also capture kind of how they treat it with that wonderful like cop black humor I think I suppose you'd have to have some black humor because if if that's your job going in there knowing you may you're going to risk your life every single day. But like you said, it really doesn't turn out to be the case, but you have to be prepared for it. I mean, how do you do it? You got to have a little black humor in there. And, and here's what else I love. As the reader, we couldn't help but think, would I be capable of that? Gosh, I wish I would. Yeah, I'd like to yeah. think I would. Yeah. Um, it's pretty cool. It took the reader to another place. Like, Consider, would you be able, we maybe in our own lives think often, I would die for my kids. I would die for my yeah. husband, right? We're yeah. used to that. But somebody that we're not related to, but that we hold in high regard, like the president, would we dive in front of him and save him from a bullet? This is like a split second decision that is so ingrained in your psyche, you're not even thinking of anything else. I guess the same as military training, but you took us to a cool place there. Thank you. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's actually, because I had uh, my first child last year and so that was where I could relate to, um, you know, be like, oh yeah, a hundred percent. I'm going to jump in front of that car. Uh, I mean, what's even crazier about the Secret Service is you will take a bullet for this guy you may not like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but and there's an interesting distinction between protecting the office of the presidency mm -hmm. and the particular president. Um, and then you know the book plays with like, but what if? that particular president is going against the office and the kind of moral challenges of that. Yeah. Congratulations, by the way, on your child that you have. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you about another theme that emerged in your story, and that is this idea of truth and lies. Now, some of your characters remain nameless because we're not giving away any spoilers, held on to some sincerely held beliefs, even as evidence emerged to contradict those beliefs. And I wanted to ask you, you know, what happens when you realize you've been fighting for a lie? Do you think most people double down or maybe they are persuadable and they will examine whether or not this is something they need to reevaluate? What do you think? They double down. <laughs> um, and there's, I mean, there's like good research on this. So if your friend comes to you and is like, I think the president is um, a lizard person. You're like, well, okay, let's for a sec um or whatever they're on like if you it, there's research that shows that if you like show them data 
they were entrenched in that belief. And I don't, I don't really know what you do about that. Um, one theme in the book is how people with certain beliefs, mm -hmm. certain kind of like silos of information or whatever it is, and we're, or we're all in different ones, you know, um, they can be like different, living on a different planet. You know, how do you get across that? Um, and I mean, that's why it's easier to treat these things in books because I don't have the answer. Uh, but you know, examine it in these books, and it's you know, it's really um, because when have, well in the book, people go different ways, you know, so. Um, at the margin some people are convincible and i i guess i guess that's one of the answers you know in in the book without giving anything away people's kind of human to human connections let them go across those um different point of view boundaries and other people are just so far gone that they only double down so that is something that sort of comes out in the book and maybe that's um a hopeful aspect of it that certain people you know their human connection can can bring them out of it. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, there were people who were um, very in far, but on both sides, you know, on a, the bad guy side and the good side, because yeah. they and you had know invested, who too. right? <laughs> but yeah. they had invested so much in terms of their energy, their relationships, and you could see it on both ends, which is very fascinating. I thought that was a really cool theme throughout. Yeah, and this book, I mean, was it, it came premise first really and it was you know what if the president were locked in this bunker with somebody who wanted to kill him and um and then i was thinking how cool that would be because it's like die hard but also because it's like agatha christie um where you're like is it this person is it that person and then one of them turns up dead you're like i thought it was that guy and now he's dead um so it was really fun for me and i thought it would be easy and it was an incredibly, incredibly challenging book to write because of the constraints and because of orienting the reader. But I just kind of like kept grinding away at it. And then I, I'm really happy with how it came out. Yeah, we are too. Yeah, and Matthew, it was fun for the reader too because we did just that. We suspected all sorts of people. Chris, I can't give any spoilers. I was just going to say something, oh, yeah. but it's a lot of fun. And I want to say for our listeners, you definitely want to pick up this book by Matthew Quirk, Inside Threat. Yeah, it's a thrill ride. Yes, we talked about some hot button topics, but it's also a lot of fun. You're going to enjoy it. You got a mystery to solve. And Matthew, before we let you go, can you give us a little glimpse about what you might be working on next? Working on next? Well, I haven't even showed it to the, I, I mentioned the idea to the editor, so we'll see. Good. Okay. And this, we could talk in two years and I'll be like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> Sometimes it don't work. But um, yeah, the setup is you have an actress who plays um, typically like tough female characters. And so the actress like, actually has done as actors do like the training the firearms training and the you know the the mat work martial arts and stuff and then her friend disappears and in searching for the friend she gets caught up in all this sort of espionage stuff and diplomatic stuff and she has to kind of become like the character she plays which is very different than her day to day you know as she gets into it she realizes like oh i've been playing a role and now I need to step up. So, and then her actor skills let her do the undercover stuff better. So that's, it's very early, but that's what I'm uh, in the thick of right now. I, I love awesome. the idea of that. I love oh, the cool. idea that well, that's like every, every person an everyday person, the reader's going to like that because that shows us maybe we can step up and be something yeah. amazing, yeah. you know? And it's, it's fun because, oh, excuse me. But like, it's fun because she has these sort of like, for show, action skills and i like to write pretty action driven books so she, you can get in pretty quickly with that but then she also has to go on that every man art mm -hmm. love it love it we're going to be looking for that and if it's not that i know it's going to be something fantastic we hope to have you back on here again on bookstorm podcast but in the meantime i want to tell our listeners how they can connect with you you can go on matthew's website matthewquirk.com he's got a little sign up there where you can get exclusive previews and even some free books you can find him on twitter as m quirk and also on facebook 
Thanks so much for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. And Instagram. Sorry. And Instagram. I yeah. saw you on Instagram and I wasn't sure. Sometimes people put up uh, false uh, personas and I wasn't sure. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Instagram too. Yeah. Matthew Quirk author. I'm getting, I'm doing more. Okay. Sounds else. great. We're going to connect with you on there too. So great to have you. Really yeah, love the discussion. Great talking to you. Thank you so much. Take care. Lots of great to hot topics there, Kristen. Oh my goodness. I love what you brought up. I think one of my favorite things is um, how you brought up this, um, this dedication to your cause, even if no, you know you've been lied to, or if you're, let's say how he referred to house of cards starts to fall apart. And no matter what, you're going to stick with it and you're going to be with your party and you're going to believe it no matter what. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a saying, nobody dies for a lie. And I think he really, really was pressing the envelope on that one. How far will these individuals potentially go? And do they realize it's a lie? You know, because maybe one or two did start to understand there was something else going on here. So in our real lives, we've got to think where we are in that spectrum. How far are we willing to go when we have a belief, it's being challenged, and maybe we don't want to look at those facts and examine our belief and maybe change our belief. Mm -hmm. And I really yeah. think like we've talked about this with some other authors before that it actually shows higher intelligence when you're willing to step away from your cause and look at facts and really consider and grow and change and learn to stick with something forever and never move it, I think doesn't show uh, as much intellect as someone who does. Yeah. I also thought that this was cool. Like this whole idea of the power of propaganda in spreading lies and believing them. Um, I, I wondered sometimes, do we even, when we're taking our cause, do we hope for bad reports for the other team? Do, or do we conjure them up? Do we, as soon as we hear the little gossip or the little slander, do we embrace it and say, this is true. This is true. Just because we want our way. Um, that's a scary thing, especially on social media. I heard somebody say, you are never going to go on social media and, and fight with someone and convince them to start a whole new belief. No possible way. Yeah. Boy, isn't that true? But it, I think like Matthew said, that's where the importance of relationships comes in. Because as you build trust with people, they're more likely to listen to what you have to say. And, and I think that too ties in with another theme or subject that came up that I thought was really interesting in this book. We didn't even have time to go into it, but this idea of chaos versus stability, you know, one of the reasons we want to protect the president is because that stability is so important. Those reverberations would be felt around the world. Our enemies would mobilize. We'd be under attack immediately if people thought that the government was about to fall. And so protecting it through per propaganda but also keeping that stability in play, absolutely essential. And, and I love that the story took place largely within a mountain because inside that mountain, all hell breaks loose, but it was contained chaos. Yeah, but so, chaos nonetheless. I, yeah. I, I, love, I think that's so true. So I, I really um, think of this all the time with the military. They always fight for this country. They always support the president, whether or not they believe in him, whether or not they think he's right. Are they doing that because they believe in the presidency, the position of presidency? I don't think so. I think they believe in the U.S., the United States of America, and that what that position represents. And that's why we support that or the Congress or, you know, whatever else you may think of in our government, we may not always agree, but we support the ideal of it, the idea of democracy. And uh, that's a tricky, that can be a gray area and it can be tricky, but I felt a little of that in this book too. Oh yeah. And, and again, I think what you were saying is spot on because it also goes back to that idea of stability and making sure that the office of the president and of course, Congress, right? We're a representative republic. So that Congress also needs to have that level of stability. And it, it's just interesting. I love all of these stories that explore the power and the threats to power. And this is certainly one of those. Yeah. And don't you feel that I feel I've seen this in this country, and this is something that I actually love that we do. We can argue amongst each other and we should. We're a democracy. We should have two voices, have three voices. That's what we're about. But when it comes to this nation being at war with another nation, we band together. 
It's a cool thing. So we can argue amongst ourselves, but let our nation come under um, jeopardy or danger. And I love the way this country puts aside their differences and fights together for one, some common good that we can find that we have in common. And that's the love of this nation, the love of our land. Do you think, I think that is absolutely something we should explore further. Do you think that we all recognize though, what constitutes a danger? Uh, good. That's, a, I feel like this is a trick question, Kristen. <laughs> No, I'm really asking. <laughs> Querying minds want to know. Say, <laughs> I'm going to say no. Obviously, no. Exactly. And that's where we probably we wreak the havoc. Some realize yeah. this is a danger and some don't. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, I think so. Because you brought up a great point. Literally, we could talk about that for a week. Yeah, so good. And let me just say one more thing. Um, what about this whole idea that we have to embrace this? No president is perfect. No secret service man is perfect. No political leader is perfect. However, and let me speak to them when I say this, they are held to a higher accountability than the rest of us. And this can be a scary thing. I'm, I thought of this as the reader, when you sign up for one of these positions, you are signing up to be judged differently, to be held accountable differently than the everyday citizen. You're not allowed to do certain things. And this, this, I think this could be a little bit terrifying, a little bit uh, scary, a little dangerous. You better realize what you're signing up for. Yeah. Well, I think the important word you used there was leader because leadership principles, you know, one of them is you have to have that moral authority with the people that you lead. Otherwise you can't force them to follow you, but they should want to follow you because they believe that you are for their good and you're taking them in a good direction. So when we see cracks, when we see misbehavior, we can't have that in a leader, mm -hmm. right? Of even a, a leader of a business. So mm -hmm. I thought that was a, an excellent thought. Yeah, and I like what you said, that they're looking for the good. That comes back to the quote in the book, people will do the right thing, institutions will hold. The truth always comes out in the end. Whether or not that is true or not, we gotta believe it. We gotta believe it. Or, or why are we gonna fight for it? Cool yeah. stuff in this book by Matthew Quirk. Um, readers, you're just going to love it. It really was a thrill ride, but some really great stuff. And I want to say thank you to you know who, I always mention them, sound engineer extraordinaire, producer behind the scenes, Mr. Mark Carey. We miss him in person like crazy. He's off to do greater things, but still helping us in the background. And we're going to leave you with a few storm predictions to pique your interest and maybe you want to read ahead. We've got Madeline Martin, the keeper of hidden books, Bryn Turnbull, Paris Deception, Katie Quinn and Janie Chang, The Phoenix Crown, Marie Benedict, Victoria Christopher Murray, The First Ladies, Viola Shipman, AKA Wade Rouse, Famous in a Small Town, Ashley Audrin, The Whispers, Fiona Davis, Spectacular, Sandra Brown, Out of Nowhere, um, Greg Hurwitz, The Last Orphan, and a special treat, a children's book that we love by Tiffany Hammond called A Day Without Words. Oh, I can't wait to talk about those. And a few of those books kept me up all night. So let's just, you know, out of fear. <laughs> so listeners, we are so excited. Please continue to share our socials. We love talking with you. We love diving into these deep subjects. And we just love the support that you're showing all of these authors. We're just absolutely thrilled. So please stay on the radar with us. You can visit our website at bookstormpodcast.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, on TikTok. You can see us on YouTube. Just search for Bookstorm and Podcast, and we should come right up. So until next time, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction.